Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis, and this week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at CrossFit Auto Body, located in Union City. CrossFit Auto Body is the perfect place to begin your fitness journey. Come in and become part of the CrossFit community. Visit uccrossfitautobody.com for more information. Welcome to Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America, located up here in the corner of beautiful West Tennessee. Every day at our museum and heritage park, we inspire children and adults to see beyond. And each week, we do the same thing here on our podcast. In today's episode, Scott sits down with Danny Walden, who is a former teacher, administrator, and current overseer of the Professional Development Center in Dyer County. Hello, I'm Scott Williams, host of Real Foot Forward, where each week, just like at our museum and heritage park here in Union City, we explore the culture, spirit, accomplishments, and the heritage of our beautiful home here in West Tennessee. Because it's referenced in a song performed by the Grateful Dead, the lost town of Minglewood, Tennessee has become a mythical place deadheads and music fans from around the world search for. Today, we're going to tell you exactly where it is and how you can find it. Today's guest is former teacher, administrator, and current overseer of a professional development center in Dyersburg, Tennessee, and he's very involved in the Dyer County Historical Society. Please help me welcome Danny Walden. It's so great um, to have you here. I know that um, when I visited your museum, I was blown away by all the fascinating history that's there. Um, Tell me a little bit about your involvement with the Historical Society and the museum, and and what do you do for them? I'm the president of the Dyer County Historical Society and have been for several years. Uh, As luck would have it, uh, we have the museum displayed in the library of my old high school. So I'm basically back home. And uh, it's an honor to be serving this way. And I was a history major uh, when I went to school at UT Martin. Uh, Didn't realize I was going to be working in this capacity. Um, But we're open to the public two days a week. We're a board of 15 volunteers. And we try to maintain as much of the local history about Dyer County as we can. Uh, be that through artifacts and collections, stories, images, pictures, things like that. Um, And we've been doing this since 2004. Uh, So we're relatively new. And there's been history of other historical societies that have tried to gain hold uh, over the years in Dyer County, but for one reason or another, they sometimes collapse. And when I started becoming involved in it in 2004, my goal was let's make this have some sustainability. So that's what I'm doing. That's incredible. And you are you were a early transplant to the area, as I understand. How long have you been living in the area? Actually, I was born in Paducah, Kentucky. And so my family moved to Dyersburg. My dad was a pharmaceutical salesman. I had a, a region. He wanted to get in the middle of the region. And he looked at several places and landed in Dyersburg. So uh, even though I'm not a native of West Tennessee, I feel like I am because I've always been there. Mm -hmm. Um, You, um, obviously education is uh, important to you. So tell me a little bit about your education and and your school days. I I went to school at Hollis Powell School in Dyer County, uh, which was an elementary school just a a mile from my house. Um, Went to Dyersburg High School, played basketball there. And I guess luck would have it that the state of Tennessee decided in 1969 to start putting community colleges across the state. And Dyersburg State opened when I graduated in 1969, and they had a basketball team. And so I thought, well, rather than go to Martin and start my four-year career, I'm just going to stay here and play basketball for a couple of years. I did that, had a wonderful time. It's been 50 years since I played basketball out there, and we're celebrating Dyersburg State's 50th anniversary this year. And so when I left you know, uh, Martin, uh, left Dyersburg, I went to Martin, didn't play ball, 
But uh, I got my teaching certificate and came back to, uh, to Dyersburg and Dyer County and served as a teacher and principal administrator. And now I'm retired and working in the Historical Society. And what uh, subject did you teach? I taught elementary school. So I taught a lot of different grades, uh, different subjects in elementary, but mostly science and social studies uh, for nine years before I became an administrator. And hit, was history always interesting to you? You know, it always has been. And... Um, it's funny that when I get to this point in my life, I look back on it and think, well, you know, all these things I've been doing had a historical uh, bent to it. And so um, um, it is a great interest to me. And I try to focus on Dyer County history because if I'm, not, if I'm not careful, we'll wander off into other areas because people bring us things from all over the place and say, look at this. And I'm going to meet with a man tomorrow who called me from Jackson, who's coming to the town to ask questions about some artifact he's got. Um, another lady brought me a, a mastodon tooth that was dug up down at Sandburg. And, of course, those things are not Dyer County history, but I'm still interested in those. Yeah, and you know of a museum you can always call if you ever That's find right. anything you don't <laughs> like. You just call us. You think you got some room up here? We, got, we, we have got more room. We can always <laughs> fit in a few more artifacts, especially if they're from the region. Um, so how many, how many uh, folks do you have in your historic society there? In Dyer County. Roughly 75 or 80 paying members. That's great. That's really um, strong. And we've just started trying to have monthly presentations that are historically, historically significant to the local population. So people will come in. Now, most of the people who come to these presentations are uh, of the older crowd. We haven't quite hooked the young crowd yet. But these stories are things that a lot of these people remember. We did a thing yesterday on uh, the movie that was filmed partially in Dyer County called In the Heat of the Night that was the 1967 uh, Academy Award Best Picture. Uh, and part of that was filmed in Dyer County. Mm -hmm. and part so, of it was also filmed at the, the, at the opening scene. They used the train station um, in Brownsville in Haywood County. I wasn't sure where that, bra that train yes. station was. It's brown. I actually wrote a blog post about it um, and I watched the whole movie yes. and looked for more. Um, it's, an, it's a fascinating movie uh, to watch. It's disturbing, um, yes. <laughs> but it's uh, interesting for, for the area. Have you watched the uh, director's cut? Version no. with the voiceover. No, Have I that? haven't. Yes, I, Luke has. He's shaking yes. his head. I got. I got to watch that. Where did you? Where did you buy the CD? Yeah, online? I just bought it. You know, okay. online and got it. And and basically, if you're into history and uh, the production of a movie and the lighting and the actors and the stories that go behind the scenes, that those of us who are young remember some of this when it happened. You hear these rumors <laughs> about things that did or didn't happen. And sometimes it's good to get the people who actually participate in the movie telling you the story. Yeah. Wait, so you already had that event? Yesterday. Darn. I missed it. I'll, I'll go I'm to a, the next one. You I'll have. add you to my email list. Yeah, please yeah. do. Okay. I, I absolutely uh, want to be added. Yeah. Um, so so how, did, how did you get involved? in? You, did, how did you first <laughs> hear about the, the Historic Society there? It's interesting because um, years ago, Dyer County had a— uh, an event for two years in running that was called the MacGyver's Bluff Festival, kind of like a little fall festival down around the square. And some of the people in the courthouse put tables in the courthouse and let people bring artifacts and put them on display. And for two years, people were saying, boy, this is kind of cool. We need to have a museum. We need to have a place for this kind of stuff. And that was when I was still working in the school system. I had no knowledge of what they had done until... Um, they decided to move this place to exhibit these this, these artifacts into the basement of my old high school, and I was working upstairs. And so my job was basically to help train teachers in the main floor of the building, and in the basement was this little thing that was an historical society. And they would call me and say, the air conditioning's not working, we've got a light bulb out, or there's a window broken or something. So I would go to those meetings to report on what I could do to keep the building um, up and running for them. And one day, one of them said, we need to get Danny on the board. He comes to our meetings. So many of our board members don't come. And so I started going to board meetings. Next thing you know, I'm a member. Next thing you know, they've elected me an officer. And so now we brought all those things that you saw yeah. to the main floor, and we're in 
the library, which is my high school library, uh, and that's where the majority of our exhibits are. And it's it's we've got a good collection. We're doing a good job with um, preserving them through acid-free boxes and trying to um, put them away and, and just duplicate things so people see the story without having the actual artifact. And the public knows where we are now, and they bring us things. And that's so, amazing. What 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 do you think is? It seems like people either get it or they don't uh, when it comes to <laughs> preserving history and taking care of the past. And wh- wh- why do you think it's important that we do the work that you're doing in preserving history? That's a good question, and I, I've thought a lot about my philosophy. And, and basically, I look at it personally from the standpoint of somebody else did these things so that I know these stories. Somebody before me. Most people have done this before me, probably dead and gone. But I think about things like Dyersburg State Community College. You know, that institution came along at the right time for me, but somebody had to make the decision in Nashville to do these, you know, community college, this concept across the state, and it just happened to hit me. Somebody else prior to my time um, did the legwork to have the bridge across the Mississippi River that benefits all of West Tennessee. And so I benefit from that. And then anybody who has thought enough to hold on to the stories, to keep the pictures, to save the Bible from you know the attic or the barn or, or the storage building um, or the estate sale, all those things that sometimes people just go, just get rid of that. But there's people who basically understand the importance of hanging on to these things and they either hold on to them until it's they get to the end of their life and saying, okay, now I need to do something with it. That's when people like us uh, are there ready to carry on that heritage. Right. It breaks my heart to be at a thrift store and see an old Bible with, you know, yes. names in it or see photographs that are black and white and, you know, that, you know, you know, those were people that posed and they had been passed down and somebody at some point, the chain was broken yeah. and somebody didn't care and they ended up there. I, I have bought Bibles before and tried to track down. I was successful once, but track down the family you know, and that's why I have a blog and a website, so you can post that kind of that kind of information, and people can benefit from it and find it. And, but you're absolutely right. Uh, I'm so glad that you and, and the folks there in Dyer County are taking care of all that. Well, and, and we're trying to, and and we know that that in today's world with interstate highways and people traveling like they are, and the popularity of um, the Cracker Barrel stores. You know, when you go in those little old country stores, it's really neat to sit there and look at all these things hanging around where you're going to eat lunch or, or supper, and you're going like, is that real? And I don't know how they do this, but my impression is they do seek these kind of things out at estate sales and yard sales and things, and they warehouse them, and when they open a new store, they bring it in, and somebody arranges it and makes a decoration out of it, and it's homey. It feels comfortable, and I would like to see things that are historically significant be in a museum or on display for the public, uh, as well as on display, you know, in a place of business like that. I think that uh, you're right. The images of people bother me as much as anything because you might find something that is a group of people, maybe it's school kids outside their school, and you don't know who they are, you know. But somebody took the picture, and somebody does. It would be so awesome if we could collect those and be able to help maintain that story. Uh, for future generations. And that's what historical societies do. That's, so that's so what we do. Hats off for that. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Minglewood and the town of Minglewood. Uh, before uh, we start talking about where it is and what it was, let's get a little context. Um, let's listen to a little snippet of a recording of Noah Lewis's Minglewood Blues. When you Come to Memphis, please stop by Mangalwood. When you come to Memphis, please stop by Mangalwood. There's that women's in the camp zone. Me no, me no. 
so the words that you heard there were, if you're ever in Memphis, better stop by Minglewood. The women down there, they don't mean a man no good. So um, that was a, a, a song that was written by uh, Noah Lewis and performed, that version was performed by Noah Lewis's Jug Band from 1930, and that band included uh, Sleepy John Estes, who was from Brownsville. He was um, uh, obviously a well-known uh, musician from this area. Um, Noah Lewis was born in Henning, Tennessee. Um, he wrote the song and originally recorded it on January 30th, 1928 in Memphis as part of Gus Cannon's Jug Stompers. Um, an interesting note that I ran across while I was looking this up is that jazz pianist and songwriter Eddie Green, who wrote the 1920s hit A Good Man is Hard to Find, among many other things, uh, later claimed that he helped Noah write that song. While Noah died in 1961, in obscurity from gangrene brought on by frostbite, he's, he's uh, buried in Netbush. Um, uh, Eddie Green went on to be a jazz pianist of huge fame, of, of huge acclaim, you know, released lots of, uh, lots of uh, albums and played with all the greats. Um, so I think it's fascinating. These two guys both worked on this one song. Um, mingle with blues both took two different directions um, this song was then covered by the Grateful Dead um, there's a version of it on YouTube uh, from a concert in Anaheim on July 26 1987 on a tour they were in with Bob Dylan so if anybody's interested in hearing that version of the song you can find it on YouTube um, so I, I while I was looking at all this, I thought, wouldn't this make a great book, a book called Minglewood, and then the story of the two musicians and both of their, what happened to them after they wrote, wrote the song. So I'll, I'll pass that tidbit on to you. You can write that book. I'm glad I came. I'm learning something already. Yeah, see, there you go. <laughs> well, at Discovery Park of America, <laughs> we inspire people to see beyond every day. Um, so tell us a little bit about where Minglewood is. and Well, first tell us what it was, and then tell us... Um, how we can go visit? Where where is it? Wow. Um, let me speak to what you. Yeah, absolutely. Just, in just for a second, um, because if you research it, you're going to find two versions mm -hmm. of the Minglewood Blues from back in the twenties. Um, Noah wrote the song, and I have a picture in this stack of images we've got from back in the day. And I think that's Noah sitting at the, at the piano mm. playing the play, in the juke joint in in uh, Minglewood. Wow! Um, but my interpretation of how this progressed was that Noah sold the song, and and then uh, um, Gus Cannon recorded it on Bill in Memphis. Okay, and that was the Minglewood Blues. Noah was a bit of a. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't sure I'd call him a drunk, but he tended to imbibe some. I did see where he was, like, arrested at one point. Yes. For, and he was jailed in Dyer County, maybe. Or Probably. Somewhere like that. Um, and, and so when he realized that the Gus Cannon version was getting some traction uh, in the black community, he wanted to record it himself mm -hmm. and make his own money off of, it, off of his song. Mm -hmm. But since he'd already sold it, he had to rewrite it. And it became the new mingle with blues. Oh, okay. Okay, so I saw. I wondered about that. Yeah. I saw that well, there's, a, there's two versions. Okay. Mingle with blues by Gus Cannon, uh, who died in in the mid '60s, I believe, uh, maybe late '60s, um, and then Noah, who re-recorded it, and it became a hit a second time, basically. Um, the same general concept, but he had to kind of adjust it some. Um, and it wasn't until the '60s when the Grateful Dead found it. Uh, from California, and they wrote, uh, they had to rework it again, and they call it the new New Mingle with Blues. So it had several versions of, <laughs> of the song. But it did come out on the, on the Grateful Dead's first album called Shakedown Street. Um, now, the Mingle with Blues and the story of Minglewood, really, there's a whole story beyond the music. So let me back up. And let me ask you this. Do you have to tell this all? Do you get calls and people coming and visiting constantly? I had two people from Lauderdale County come see me last week. <laughs> yeah. I actually went to the library downtown, 
And the library called me and said, Danny, there's two people here who want to go to Minglewood. And I said, you send them to me because they can't go. Uh, and the reason I didn't let them go down there is because, number one, it's private property. And number two, the backwater's out. Mm-hmm. See, so it floods a lot. And I didn't want them going by, around a sign that the state puts up saying, you know, road closed. No trespassing. That's right. right. And so there's, we've got to watch that stuff. So uh, let's talk a little bit about why the town came to be there. Well, uh, the Mangle Box Company uh, was headquartered in Louisville, Kentucky, and they were listed on the New York Stock Exchange, a pretty big corporation. And they used sawmills to go across the South um, harvesting trees. And they actually set the sawmill up first in Trimble, in the Trimble area, and cut trees there. Now, when you get these trees cut, you need to get them to market somewhere. And so that's where your trains come in. And of course, Trimble had a train track, and I guess it went north of Chicago and eventually went south to New Orleans or Memphis. And so uh, the Mingle Box Company set up in Trimble, harvested trees, and when most of those trees were gone, they moved the mill down on the Obine River, which is west of Dyersburg. And so... Danny's version of how this town came to be is the Mingle Box Company is down there in the middle of the woods. That's where you get Mingle Wood. Um, But a whole um, business community sprung up around that site because you have to have people to work it. Not only cutting the trees and dragging them in to where they can get them on a rail car and get them to the mill to be actually cut, and they would cut staves for uh, barrels, or they would cut uh, the uh, shingles for houses um, and load them up and get on a train and ship the train to Dyersburg, and then it would you know, go north and south to wherever it's going to go. Um, so the Mingle Box Company uh, began there. And uh, a friend of mine in Dyersburg uh, had heard us tell these stories. And most of the time when we tell them, we're telling from our – imagination and what we think it looks like, you know, what it would look like if you were there. And he brought me a book that he bought on the internet uh, for $4 called America Then and Now. I didn't bring it in, but I got it out in the car um, because it had a picture in there inside a juke joint at Minglewood, Tennessee, and they're all black. And they're in there, they're dancing, and they're having a good time, and there's this guy sitting over at the piano and I don't know this, but I think that's probably Noah Lewis. Wow. And you make those connections, you're yeah. going like, this is pretty cool. You yeah. can actually see what we've been hearing about. And so we I ha- guess there's no other photos of him anywhere that you've seen. No, so I've, got, to- I've got a picture in the office of Gus Cannon, mm-hmm. but not of Noah. Not of Noah. Um, but then, you know, you're, you're thinking, okay, somebody's produced this book. And, and the... America Then and Now book was about the whole country. This was just one double-fold page inside a little community that used to be in Western Dyer County that we'd heard about, but we didn't know. So we contacted the University of Louisville. We're making the connection. In the back of the book, it says that the photographer who took that picture was from a photography company from Louisville by the name of Caulfield and Shook. And so we contacted University of Louisville and said, we got this one picture. It's a pretty cool you know, picture of Minglewood. Would you happen to have any others? And they sent us copies of about 35. Mm. So suddenly, you not only have a picture in the juke joint, you have a picture of the community at an outdoor uh, revival. And you have pictures of the water tank, pictures of the stacks of lumber that they've cut pictures uh, inside the sawmill itself with these huge blades that are run by uh, a central shaft like the old cotton gin used to do where you had your power to run one thing and then you put a belt on it and it operates all these other uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, And it's pretty amazing when you start seeing it uh, because you suddenly can say, okay, now I understand why this town was so vibrant because it was the town not only had the factory and the people who lived there, but you had two schools down there. And there was needed two schools back in those days because we were segregated. You had schools for the blacks and schools for the whites. At the same time, uh, the town had a hotel. 
Wow. It also had a doctor's office. It had a movie theater. And you're going like, okay, there was no reason to come to Dyersburg, you know, to get your hair cut or something to buy because you work for the man and you got paid in company script. Mm -hmm. So you got paid in a company coin, took the coins to the company store and bought your supplies, your groceries, whatever you needed. If you needed a pair of shoes or if you needed a coal oil lamp or something, you know, you bought it from the company store. Uh, and so it was a vibrant town. And, you know, suddenly you're going like, this is, you know, a pretty big deal because all this commerce is going on. And it's going on because they're harvesting trees. And so um, the people, I wonder if the prices for the things they paid, you know, the money they got, I wonder how it compared to what it would have been had they gone somewhere else. I, I don't know if they were being gouged or not. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. <laughs> I don't if know. if they were being gouged but or not. We have the coin oh. uh, in our museum. Um, and, of course, by being paid in company script, you get paid in a coin that says Mingle Box Company, but even the coin says Dyersburg, Tennessee. So they had to make the coin to be able to, you know, exchange it uh, for people who worked there, um, which, you know, opens up a whole new set of questions, you know, exactly on who handles the money, you know, and how do they get paid? And then when they get paid, is it like it is today where it just burns a hole in your pocket? Well, when you start looking at that picture inside the juke joint, you see they're blowing it out on weekends. Right. You know, when you get paid, you just go, you know, tie one on somewhere. Right. And that's kind of what these guys were doing. And that's where Noah and Gus Cannon came in. So you, what, it must have been amazing for you to finally get to see pictures of what you have actually physically stood. I can't even imagine. It was extremely revealing. And what's interesting is that uh, in 2011 – we partnered with the Smithsonian to bring a traveling exhibit to Dyersburg and put it in our museum for six weeks. It was called Amer It was called The Way We Worked, and it's still traveling the country somewhere. I'm not sure exactly where I've, it is. I've seen that. Have you seen it? it? Yeah. Um, but it was in Dyersburg um, in 2011, and the only requirement was for us to get this traveling exhibit, we were supposed to do our own little exhibit. Well, we called ours The Way Dyer County Worked. And it was perfect because at that time, we just found this book. We just saw the picture of, of Noah playing the piano in the juke joint. And so we had these photographs coming into us, and we're going like, perfect. We can now tell the story and show people how they worked down the bottoms cutting trees in the middle of a, a small town that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, no, so, so to that point, if you and I were to get in our car right now and drive down there and get permission— um, what uh, what would it look, describe it for our listeners since they obviously can't go with us this afternoon? Yeah, um, I went down about a month ago just to see how bad the backwater was and the flood water with, with the, the, all the rain we've had. Uh, I could still get to it. Uh, you basically travel on a state highway uh, toward the Mississippi River uh, west of Dyersburg, and you turn off on a gravel road, and it's, it's a well-maintained gravel road, and you'll travel about a mile, and you're in the middle of a field. And, of course, this time of year, the fields are bare because they haven't planted anything yet. When you get to the end of that gravel road, you park your car, and you get out, and you look off to the left, and you see a whole lot of trees. And if you look closely, you'll see an occasional, looks like a big concrete box sitting in the middle of those trees. And that's the, the remnants of the town. And the more you walk toward the river, the more of these things you see, the more trees you see. Uh, but you got to be careful because you'll step on a snake. Uh, when it gets to be springtime and all the greenery comes out, then you got to be careful with uh, cuckaburs and, and briars and, and poison ivy and things like that. Uh, so once the greenery comes out, it's not a place to go. And then the farmers start planting their fields, and you got to stay off of those. And all this is on private property. So when we do a field trip, and we do plan to do some on occasion. We try to do it at the right time of year with permission from all those landowners to be able to uh, help let people see how this community was laid out and the things that happened. So what people from around the world need to do is come to this area, do the field trip with you and I to go see Minglewood and then come see Discovery Park of America while they're here. Absolutely. And I'll give you another piece of information yep. because um, the interest in um, 
blues music is worldwide, and we know that. Um, there was a documentary done several years ago called Chasing Gus's Ghost. Uh, that DVD is out. I have a copy of it. Um, and it talks about the music in the Memphis Blues Delta area, uh, including uh, Minglewood. The interesting thing is when they tell the story on the DVD, they get it a little bit wrong. Uh-oh. Because what they do, they talk about Noah being from Lauderdale County, and then they go out west of Ripley and talk about Henning and those areas down around uh, Ripley and Lauderdale County. Uh, and they give you the impression that when you get back on, uh, I think it's Highway 22, that you go left and you end up in Minglewood. But that's, oh. not, that's not true because it's west of Dyersburg, not west of Ripley. And I've, I've seen posts where people think they got close, but I could tell by what they were writing that they weren't close. Right. So if somebody was interested, when you get ready to do your uh, field trip out there, where can people get more information about the Dyersburg Historic Society and sign up for your e-newsletter and things like that? Well, the best way to do that is uh, go to our webpage. Uh, it's direhistory.com, all one word, and uh, that'll get them started. We also have a Facebook page. Um, the uh, phone number for the Historical Society in Dyersburg is 731-676-8075. Uh, and we're only open a couple of days a week because we're all volunteers, but uh, we're very eager to talk to people about the history of Dyer County, uh, the music of Dyer County, the commerce of Dyer County, the education of Dyer County, the transportation and the, the uh, development of, of our community. And we're, we're very proud of that, and we're glad to tell these stories. Well, thank you for doing all that work. I've been to Minglewood Hall in Memphis, which I know is possibly named in honor of Minglewood. That's true. So now the visit to Minglewood is on my bucket list, so I'm going to be part of that next trip you have. Um, thank you so much for coming here today. I've enjoyed it. And uh, would love to come back and just talk some more. Oh, I'm absolutely going to. I had, you know, one of the questions I was going to ask you were what are some of the other stories from Dyer County? But we have lots of time for you to come back and, and share another one. So be thinking of a good one to bring back to us. Be glad to. From the Grateful Dead to a man who is grateful for the opportunity to inspire children and adults to see beyond every single day, here's Andrew Gibson to share a peek behind the scenes at Discovery Park of America. All right. Thank you, Scott. I am Andrew Gibson with the Education Department here at Discovery Park of America. Today, I am joined by Amanda Mayo, who works here, uh, who will be telling us more about one of my personal favorite artifacts we have on display here, the woolly mammoth. Amanda, thank you so much for coming on. So our woolly mammoth here at Discovery Park of America is really, really special because it is our, one of our only real fossils that we have on display. So the bones, the teeth, and the tusks that you see of our woolly mammoth um, near the Native American exhibit here at the at Discovery Park is all real bone. So it was originally part of a real animal. Ours um, is about 12,000 years old, so that's pretty, pretty old. And we'll talk about um, how exactly old that is here in a second. And it was found in the Istra River in Russia. So along the bank there, they found the skeleton. So it's really cool. Um, woolly mammoth just barely, barely makes the cutoff in order for something to become a fossil. In the Natural History Gallery, we have a really cool um, picture slash explanation on what exactly it takes for something to be considered a fossil. And a couple of those things are, number one, it has to be over 10,000 years old. And since our woolly mammoth is 12,000 years old, that's a check mark for that department to become a fossil. It also has to be naturally preserved. A lot of mammoths that we find are preserved in glaciers and other types of ice sheets so it preserves them really well and sometimes they're called like ice mummies or glacier mummies. Um, mammoths lived in the Pleistocene and they went extinct into the Holocene. The Holocene is the epic that we are in right now so that's when humans are around. So that um, the Holocene it c covers the last 10,000 years of human history and other history. So a woolly mammoth is related to a modern day Indian slash Asian elephant. And we know that just because of their bone structure and the big thing is their tusks. So we have those giant, giant, beautiful tusks on our woolly mammoth here at Discovery Park. And a lot of times they were hunted by ancient civilizations of people for those tusks. And every time they were hunted, 
they would not let a single part of the animal's body go to waste. They would use the tusks, they would use the bones, they would use the bones for tools, they used the meat, and oftentimes they used the fur of the woolly mammoth to clothe like an entire village because there's just so much skin area there. So they had four molar teeth in, in their mouths. So a molar is like what our back teeth are. So like your wisdom teeth and the teeth in the back of your mouth that we use for grinding teeth. So they had four of those. And I like to tell people they're about the size of my shoe. They could weigh up to four pounds each. And if one of those molars were to start to decay, that was really, really detrimental for the organism while it was alive. And it could eventually cause them to die because they wouldn't be able to eat because it was so painful. Woolly mammoths were hunted by ancient humans, and the, eventually we think that the humans hunted the woolly mammoth to extinction. There is one place that um, woolly mammoths went extinct all over the world, but they survived on one set of islands, and so they lived there for a little bit longer than the rest of the species across the earth, and then they finally went extinct there a while back. So from what I've heard, we might see woolly mammoths again one day. You made a lot of comparisons between them and the Asian elephant. Um, Can you touch on that some more? So uh, when scientists tried to duplicate Dolly the sheep, they eventually made a clone of the sheep, but it took 277 tries for them to successfully clone a viable offspring from the sheep. So we don't have that much DNA to work with with the woolly mammoth, but since they are so genetically similar to elephants, we might be able to do that one day. Now, we don't want another Jurassic Park type idea to happen, but um, Harvard geneticist George Church is working on that currently, and he's published a couple things since he started started the work in 2015. The word extinction is really cool to talk about because the word extinction means the complete end of a specific genetic code of an organism. So since that woolly mammoth is completely extinct, we have nothing that is that genetic code for the organism. That means it's going to be extremely hard for us to duplicate that DNA and place it in the cells of an elephant to make an offspring. So in that in that instance, with that genetic code, would you still consider woolly mammoth extinct because the genetic code has been replicated, or would that be a new classification? So that's what we call like a scientific gray area. There's um, you know there's there's no yes or no answers in science. There's only buts. So yes, since there is no living organism with that DNA, woolly mammoths are consider- considered extinct. But if we are able to duplicate that, we would have something that we call a, I think it would be a Lazarus taxa. So that term means that we think the taxa went completely extinct, so the genetic code died off, but then we find it again in the fossil record. So um, that means that it looks like it completely died off and then it came back somehow just like Lazarus from the Bible. I know a lot of our listeners, including myself, have discovered something new today. If you have the opportunity to join us at Discovery Park of America, please come up to the Starship Theater and check out our new film, Titans of the Ice Age, where you can learn more about the Woolly Man. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.